Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Millerman, and this is Millerman Talks. I have Michael Michaelidis today from Ancient Greece Revisited as our guest. I can't recommend his YouTube channel strongly enough. In fact, you should navigate over there as we're speaking. I think there's a link in the description. It's a great channel. There's also the On Tyranny podcast that Michael hosts, which is discussing contemporary political affairs, prominently the policy response to the coronavirus and what some might see as a global medical tyranny that has arisen in response to it. But Michael is a deeply interesting, well-read, very smart, sensitive, and good man. And it's truly a privilege to have him on the show today. Michael, thank you for joining. Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for uh, everything you just said. Um, I, hope, I hope most of it is true. <laughs> it's all true. And there's much more that like a good Straussian, I've kept silent. But no, indeed, you're all, you're all of those things and more as I hope our listeners get a chance to see as I've had the privilege to see uh, in the run up to today. So first of all, maybe you could say a little bit about what is ancient Greece revisited? What do you do on the channel? Why did you start the channel? And why is there a need in your view for us to revisit ancient Greece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ancient Greece revisited is a YouTube channel uh, that is created by me and one other person. Uh, I am the researcher, writer and presenter of the series, Adamantios, uh, my uh, co-creator is the director, editor and everything visual of the show. And uh, I conceived it first. Uh, it came as an idea that I had about two years ago to start uh, this show when I was living abroad. I was living in Spain at the moment, in the south of Spain. And a, a few things, I guess, came together in my life. Um, I had began writing. I had began writing short stories. I finished a novel, uh, which was much more challenging than I thought initially and um, tried to publish some, published a couple of short stories. Um, but basically it's something that I find, found kind of later in life. So I, I was writing a lot. I was always reading about ancient Greece. I was always interested about ancient Greece. And I was also watching a lot of YouTube at the, at the time. So these three things came together. And I was watching, you know, lots of podcasts, from like the Joe Rogan experience to a great podcast called Hardcore History by one Dan Carling, uh, who was an inspiration. Um, and I, I saw, you know, I, I saw a niche, if we want to talk like in, in marketing terms, but I also saw a way to speak about things that were, were on my mind for a long time, because whenever the topic of ancient Greece came up, I saw that I had a slightly different view of things. Uh, I'm Greek uh, myself, as the name implies, as is my co-creator. And, uh, you know, the topic of ancient Greece is, is part of our lives, whether we like it or not. We learn it at school, keep on learning it. It's something that we're taught to be proud of, whether we are generally proud of or not. It's something that we kind of have to be proud of. I live in Athens. It's dominated the center, the axis mundi of Athens is, you know, the hill of the Acropolis, at the top of which there is the great temple, the Parthenon, uh, Temple of Athena. Um, so wherever you are in Athens, you kind of see it. It's almost like an orientation view. And at the same time, it's, it's a ruin. And I think this con contradiction captures a lot of what it means to be a modern Greek. You know, you have a very modern city that's trying to rival um, the rest of the cities in, in Europe, although it looks much more perhaps like Middle Eastern cities. Um, it looks much more like Tel Aviv than it does Paris. Athens does. Uh, but and yet at the center, you have this ruin of this great civilization that's no longer here. And it left these rocks if, if you want to be very prosaic and somehow you you need to piece them together to find out who you are um, you know the way i say it is that certain nationalities present themselves almost as a problem to be solved and uh, if that's true then greek the greek nationality is definitely one 
I wouldn't be surprised if the Jewish nationality would be another. Uh, perhaps we could exchange views on that. But from my standpoint, the Greek is is definitely one. And the reason it presents itself as a problem is because it has all this wealth and all these contradictions. You know, like even where I, I can see myself at the camera, there's an image of the Virgin Mary behind. Um, I'm not particularly religious in that sense, traditional Orthodox, but it's part of my house. So, you know, I'd be lying if that if if I would say that that is not a part of my culture. It is a part of my culture, yet uh, there's this other part. Uh, I can pull out books uh, to 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 contrast. You know, um, the pre-Socratics, and I could juxtapose them here, and you could see these two elements: the Orthodox, the Greek, and they came into conflict historically. Uh, we know that. And today, in a time of turbulence, cultural turbulence and decline, you find that people almost choose Greeks who are interested, because not everyone is, will choose sides. And they'll behave sometimes like football uh, uh, supporters, whether they're pro-ancient Greece or pro. And regardless, you have both, whether you like it or not, and somehow you need to resolve them. So every time I was thinking about these things, I saw that I was thinking about them a little bit different than I w what I was taught at school, than what I was taught at, uh, from the general culture. And people would listen as well. Back when I was very young and I was struggling to get people to listen to me, they would listen more when I spoke. So this thread was running, I guess, throughout my life. And when I saw, uh, you know, like what YouTube proved to me, was that people were interested in this longer format. Uh, although my show is not particularly long format as it stands, but the long format showed that, yes, on one side you have this um, tendency for, for, you know, the, the attention span, as we say, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And especially advertisers, you know, they need to compete for like these milliseconds that you can have your your mind switched on. Um, but at the same time, these podcasts that I mentioned prove that no, people will go the extra mile if it's there to be to be taken uh, and if they're interested. And for instance, I mentioned Dan, Car Dan Carling, who has this, uh, it's not even a video, it's, 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 it's audio only. And he did four, he did, uh, his claim to fame originally was he did this great uh, uh, show about the first, world war and it was four four episodes of four hours each uh each for each year of that war so it was a lot and i've listened throughout many times well two three times to be you know and uh i know that many so the i saw there was this audience that was thirsting for something more than these sound bites uh through other people's shows so i thought i could i would put everything that I just said together and create my show. So I had this idea. Uh, I, I took um, uh, six months off work. I stayed in Spain, a uh, magical time, very monastic, uh, lonely, but cre creative and disciplined. Um, and I wrote down 50 episodes, full episodes. Uh, so I came with this tre treasure <laughs> back and I was, didn't know what to do uh, and how I would start it. And I just bumped through a, through a common acquaintance. I bumped into Adamantios Petritis is his name, um, director uh, whose father actually was, did uh, d uh, documentaries about ancient Greece back in the 90s. Uh, uh, he's passed away now, so uh, my director is carrying the torch. But it was very interesting because I didn't know that his father was... I wouldn't say famous, but he was well known in the arts community, let's say, in uh, in Greece. And he did um, a documentary series with Peter Ustinov, a very old, imposing actor. So that was yet another uh, kind of synchronicity came together. And we started and he just jumped in the project. He loved it. He made it his own, which was the greatest compliment I could receive. And we've been going ever since. Um, Let me just say, if people haven't had a chance to watch the videos yet, they should, and you'll see that the production value is very high. There's very, it's fittingly dramatic for the topic of revisiting ancient Greece. 
And there's an appetite, as you say, for good old stories and for good modern storytellers to bring them alive again. So you've been doing a great job of that on your channel. I just want people to understand that the production value and the writing and the content and the topic, it's all very good, very rich and somehow ex extremely relevant to us as well. Both the religious dimension, the longing for some teaching about love, beauty, art, history, meaning, myth, magic, and man, that is not reducible to race, gender, racism, fascism, and equity, diversity, and all of that. So at the very same time that, like I have here, I printed out that the Princeton Classics Department is basically declaring war on classics and on the study of Greece, like they put it here, they want to see how the cultures of Greece and Rome have been instrumentalized and have been complicit in various forms of exclusion, ex including slavery, segregation, white supremacy, manifest destiny. So at the same time as you have this ideological war on the classical tradition in academia, you have a revival of the genuine majesty and mystery of the classics, I think on your channel better than anywhere else. I personally love watching the videos about Dionysus, your most I think recent episode about Hermes Trimagistus, these are all extremely valuable topics for us to be considering. And so among the many things that you mentioned, and I want to give you a chance to finish what you were saying as well, you said that you're not re particularly religious in the traditional sense, but at the same time, clearly religion, theology, the holy, the sacred, and the gods are a topic for you, judging alone by the videos. So maybe that's another point you can address as we... Um, continue our conversation yes ab absolutely and relating it to the origins of this uh of of my show um you know my first let's say love uh, intellectually was mythology um i it's, and to betray my non-atheistic outlook um i do believe that somehow we come into this world with certain ideas already formed somehow that I cannot justify fully. Um, it seems that I came down with a very particular idea of combining the old and the new. I have um, memories from since I was very, very young uh, that kind of pointed to that. Um, just watching TV shows, you know, what, what attracted me was exactly these combinations. Um, like I remember one of my earliest memories, I remember um, um, an animated uh, cartoon a very long time ago uh, that showed um, some kind of alien coming down in a what looked like an Egyptian pyramid and the alien himself looked like the god Anubis and all the controls and the spaceship were hieroglyphic. It's hard to relate to very old memories because I understand the mind has the mind has a mind of its own so we construct a lot of these memories yet even so, there's a reason for constructing them like we do. And uh, I remember not knowing anything about ancient Egypt. I must have been five or six, um, not knowing what these images were, but something very strong attracted me about this, um, how everything fit together is what attracted me initially to ancient cultures. Uh, there's... Um, there's a word that comes from architecture that's called tensegrity. So it's like integrity, but tense. And it's the um, when all parts of a structure come together to mutually support each other, like in a suspension bridge. You know, every beam uh, supports every other beam, uh, or, or like a fuller dome is, is another interesting structure. Um, in these, um, ancient cultures seem to have that integrity like it's almost like every little bit contained every other bit so the shape of that pyramid although i didn't my mind was very virgin in that sense uh, i didn't know what it was but it seemed to be very fitting with the hieroglyphics which were very fitting with the shape of this alien and this this idea that everything fits together was what attracted me to these ancient cultures and the combination with a very futuristic being a space alien is, you know, uh, a spaceship. And, and that, this the, was almost like a moment of recognition rather than learning. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in ancient Greek, you have this word for truth, aletheia, which uh, etymologically means 
on forgetting, so remembering. Um, there's a moment where you learn something and it feels like you're remembering it again, like you had already learned it. And th this moment was almost like I was remembering something, although I was very, very, very young. And uh, this uh, stayed with me. So, I, you know, I have um, a little book somewhere that I was writing about ancient pyramids when I was 12, 13. Uh, I think what attracted me was the ancient Egyptians built pyramids and the Mesoamericans, the Mayas, the In Incas, they built pyramids. So I was trying to do some comparative study <laughs> back then when I was 13. Uh, and so when I discovered Joseph Campbell, uh, at the age of 17, I think, it felt like I, oh, I was already prepared to read it. I even remember reading his uh, the first book of his that I read, which was not The Hero with a Thousand Faces, by the way, was, was, was another one. I was almost like skipping the page, like I knew nothing. I was 17 and not even that well read for a 17-year-old because uh, I was partially dyslexic. So I had and still have problems reading. I'm a very slow reader. Um, and I used to be a slow speaker as well. Hopefully that got cured at some point. But the originally, I, I remember almost uh, skim reading it, as we say, almost like I knew most of it, but I didn't. I didn't. But there was something, again, there was this recognition that, yes, uh, myths do hold some truth codified in metaphor. You know, uh, what perhaps Jordan Peterson is doing now and is capturing uh, the world I think Joseph Campbell did much better and much more profoundly uh, um, back then. Uh, I'm sure that if I were 17 now, I would have followed Peterson to some degree. But I think there was a depth in Joseph Campbell that uh, someone like Jordan Peterson lacks um, to his demise, to, to be honest. But this idea of comparative mythology was my first love. Uh, this idea that stories contain something that we can call uh, more than true not just true, like more than true. Were you making sense of it then? How it is that it's a recognition for you? Did you have an inclination as you were reading this with a instant sense of familiarity? Not just that you were learning about the content of the works that Campbell was teaching you about myth and comparative mythology, but also that your sense of who you are as a human being changed as a function of that strange phenomenon of recognition or was that not yet forming or perhaps I it um, was not yet for, forming because you know my mind had already these boxes that the way I'm going to define myself is something that would be fitting in society so if instead of Joseph Campbell I discovered my talent for sports uh, for instance which I don't didn't have and don't have um that would be okay that's who I am or if it was my talent for something that you can actually study in university with a promising career. Um, again, I would jump to that and I would say, that's who I am. But because mythology was none of that, I did not have this moment of, of finding myself. I felt attracted and interested, but I did not identify more with it because I was, you know, 17 rather than seven. So I already was corrupted to a certain degree by, by society. Um, so it's much later that I'm repaying the debt to Campbell. We did a uh, four-part series about Jason and the Argonauts, the Argonautic journey, which is a myth that Campbell uh, had used to, uh, to, to elaborate, embody his theory of the hero's journey. Uh, which is a universal pattern that he found underlining most hero mythologies. And uh, uh, so we did the four-part uh, series uh, because the Argonautica, the original or one version of the epic uh, by uh, Apollodorus was in four rhapsodies. So each rhapsody, one episode using uh, the uh, Joseph Campbell's theories. So I think that went pretty well. It's online. And I felt, uh, not that I'm done with Campbell uh, by any sense, but that I had kind of repaid my dues, you know, many, decades later. Uh, so what would you say was the next main step or stage for you on the path to where you are now after encountering comparative mythology and Campbell? 
So the next step was a very interesting one. I was actually thinking about it yesterday in preparation. Um, and it involved someone's death, not someone that I knew personally. Um, but in 1998, uh, we were informed by the news that a, a certain professor uh, had disappeared in the Mount Taigetos, which is the mountain of Sparta. Okay. And his name was Dimitris Liadinis. And whoever's Greek might recognize the name. He was a professor of classics. Um, he was very popular, very loved by his, but no one knew him outside of academia. No one until that moment when he, he disappeared. A couple of days later, a letter was found um, that he had written, uh, betraying the fact that he had uh, you know, willfully departed, is how we say people who still love him, uh, we'll probably say it that way. He willfully departed from this world. Uh, he was from Sparta, by the way. So he was a Spartan and to a certain degree identified with that. He left a letter to his surviving daughter um, explaining how this was a very willful action that he apparently was preparing. He said, all my life I was preparing for that moment. He was 57 years old uh, when he did that. And... Um, five years later, they found the remains of someone who... Uh, it was probably him. Uh, there was a myth that circulated, which is unconfirmed, probably not true in the typical sense, but perhaps more than true, <laughs> like we said about mythology, that his remains were discovered inside of a cave, his skeleton still sitting on a rock, reading a book. Okay, I think that book was Nietzsche's as well was identified. So you can imagine that great scene, probably not literally true, but very true to who that person was. Yes, this was a very fitting image for his death after having read his books. So um, I, th I think it took me a year to actually pick up one of his books. It's actually recommended uh, by, by another, another friend. Um, his last book, his swan song called Gemma, is the title, contains the, the seeds of ancient Greece revisited because he showed me that Greece could be done in, in a different way, so to speak, different to what I had learned at school. He combined, uh, again, the old and the new. He would jump from um, uh, a, a verse from Heraclitus to uh, the relativity theory of Albert Einstein. You know, and through th back and forth, there were some very common themes that came out of this book. It was a very uh, romantic book. Uh, I think he would even use that term because ro romanticism properly was something that he was very interested in and the works of Goethe. And uh, he studied in Germany, he studied romanticism. So I think he tried to bridge. I think he, he found that the Holy Grail would be some bridge between classicism and romanticism. Um, perhaps he tried to do. You know, many years later, looking back, I understand he was not the most profound of thinkers. He was a poet, mostly, but he inspired me very early on. And uh, what he, the note that he left for that book, he said, he said, I wrote that book um, out of the, the anger that one day I will no longer be. And that captures a lot of his spirit, because death, was very big in his in, in in his work and he promoted something that was very new for me um very groundbreaking and was the key to start understanding the greeks in a different way and that is that their unique concept of death and the afterlife or the lack thereof because the greeks in a certain way were perhaps the only people in history, uh, not to have created democracy and you know mathematics, they did all that. We can discuss how whether these inventions are misunderstood or not. But the one thing that they were unique was that their lack of an afterlife, their lack of of a, of of immortality after death, uh, which is present in pretty much all cultures now. A lot of people listening might say, you know, what about the Orphic cults and the uh, mysteries of Eleusis and, and Dionysus? That is also true, but that 
came later in, in the background. Um, to understand Greek, Greece better, you have to think that there were at least two currents running simultaneously, spiritual currents. The one was the Homeric conception of the world. Okay, so how does Homer, the poet, present death? You find it in his second epic, uh, the Odyssey, in the 12th uh, Rhapsody, sometimes called Nekia, which means um, something like ne ne necromancy. Uh, and it's where Odysseus, Ulysses, visits the land of the, of the dead. Um, he goes up in the North Sea, um, I think at the north of the Black Sea. Um, uh, he was led there uh, by, uh, by the sorceress uh, Circe um, after defeating her. And uh, he, he, he is told where and how to come into contact with the dead because he needs the, the help of one particular dead who was the seer, uh, the prophet uh, Tiresias. Um, and the way Homer describes the dead is worse than the most um, atheistic idea. You know, for the atheists, you have this notion that when you die, uh, the lights uh, turn off, as they say. There's nothing, there's, you're not even going to be there. It's, it's kind of Epicurean uh, afterlife, where uh, Epicurus said that when death is here, we are not, so there's nothing to worry about. That's one conception. Of course, there's the conception that there is a lot afterwards, which is the Christian, the Muslim, the Jewish, to a certain degree, conception, and uh, pretty much it. And then you have the Homeric conception, which is um, different and, and, and more frightening than both, which is the way the dead and the dead that Ulysses came in contact were not just any dead. They were his comrades from the War of Troy, the heroes. Okay, so the Homeric world was an offshoot of the larger Indo-European world. You know, the, uh, the Iliad, the first poem, uh, where we are introduced to these heroes, uh, is equivalent to the perhaps Bhagavad Gita uh, of, of India. Uh, so it's this idea of these uh, noble chariot warriors uh, who fight for glory and, and fame Im immortal. And... Um, when that world becomes Greekified fully, you have this notion of the afterlife that you find in the next epic, the Odyssey, where Odysseus meets these heroes and sees them as Homer described without noose, without mind or will. They're like shadows, worse than shadows. They're like vampires or shadows of vampires because they need to drink blood to remember uh, who they were. And one of them, one of these dead, is Achilles, who is the most glorious, the most noble, the most honored of the Greeks who fought in the Trojan War, in the first epic of Homer. And now he's just one of these vampires. There, I call them vampires, of course, but Homer's image is quite bleak. And he, he drinks blood to remember who he was. And there's this amazing scene where Odysseus turns to uh, to Achilles and almost repeats a very standard poetic form that you find in the Iliad where one hero kind of um, glorifies the other, uh, whether he's friend or foe. If he's a friend, he glorifies the other because it's a friend or if it's a foe, the more glory, the more honor one you kill him, you know. So he g goes into this linguistic pattern, Odysseus, talking to Achilles, he says, you, Achilles, the most honored of the Greeks back when you fought against Troy, must surely be a king among the, the dead here in the afterlife. And Achilles turns and says something memorable. He says, better to be a slave to a man with no land in the land of the living than a king in the land of the dead. That is the image that Homer paints for us. You know, um, whoever you are, whatever you are, you're going down there and there's, there's nothing you can do about it. doesn't matter who you were. Somehow the Greeks managed to live with this for some time. And then it got lost. And when it got lost, it got slowly replaced by another view, which was 
the more Orphic, Dionysiac, mystery cults that perhaps pre-existed the Indo-Europeans and survived them. Today, people who are very interested in mysticism, you know, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the Orphic, uh, the, 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 the golden uh, plaques of Orphism that were found over some, some tombs that give instructions to the soul of how to um, be guided back to the, to the gods once it dies. This is not the Homeric world, however. We have to keep a clear eye at least in the beginnings of this culture, before it got pulled away. You know, there's kind of two views of history, more or less. One is one of progress, which is the most common, that every generation, every civilization adds to the previous one and does one more step to some ladder that leads somewhere because very few people can actually find an end goal to humanity uh, yet they do believe in progress somehow and there's another very minority group and perhaps heidegger uh, believed in this um th that it, it's a fall you know that that homer got it the the very early greeks they got it the world as it is you know and then everything that came later was a slow decline from that so whichever is the case i'm tr trying to get back to this homeric to the disappointment of many listeners who prefer this mystic uh, uh kind of life rebirth circle of life i'm talking about these things as well by the way and i'm trying to put them in their place but i'm trying to get to their very core and to go back to that Ladinis kind of lived that we believe that he talked about this and he nevertheless willfully departed at the age of 57, which sounds like a contradiction because if you believe there's nothing, nothing else, then why not wait? <laughs> you know, why not wait? But it's not a contradiction because it's exactly if you believe that there's nothing else, then life loses its quantitative uh, 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 element. You know, the, the one more year for what? If you're going to end up, if Achilles was there the way I described him, one more year, five more years of what? You know, like, like you know, now we're going on this medical craze worldwide with, with well, try not to mention names that, that get the videos de Montas, but, um, and, you know, and, and doctors have this expression, they say, you know, we'll buy time if you're ill, you know, we'll, for what they never tell you so if you have this homeric view the, there's nothing you know the, there's nothing to wait for there's nothing to hold you back um i can't live like this by the way you know i i i i, I do have notions of of immortality in my mind um but perhaps ladinis this person did and he left us with a book and he left us with this idea so that was the next step for me, this this absorbing what this man had to say. Okay. I want to know what happened next, but first I have to ask you, because I had a conversation with Kenji Hayakawa about his book Echo and Grow the other day, and the main character Echo represents the scientific, technological, calculative, mathematical world interpretation, the one that reigns now, or we could say that reigns at the end of history. And this character also begins in his dialogue by addressing death, and by saying that there is no afterlife, there's nothing to fear, there's also nothing to hope for, there's nothing. In other words, he's a nihilist, as he mm -hmm. understands himself. Is the Greek, Homeric Greek presentation of the absence of an afterlife, like or unlike contemporary nihilism, if it sees also that there's nothing beyond our lived existence, if it's distinct how is it distinct? And what did this key of understanding the Homeric world, what lock did it open for you? What new vistas did it make available to you? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's unlike. It's not like, because that is the key. That is the answer in a certain way. And sometimes I have glimpses of it, but I, I don't have the full answer. Like, how could these people have this view and not slip into nihilism? Nihilism is no joke. 
uh, if if Jordan Peterson had one thing right, that would be it. It's not a it's not a lifestyle. Nihilism is 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 just the prelude to to unglorious death, either physical or I know that Carl Jung had this expression that the 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 subconscious, the unconscious has a has I think he said a thousand ways to kill to dispose itself of a life that had lost its meaning. And in Carl Jung's terms, that could be uh, falling asleep behind the wheel, uh, accidentally taking too many painkillers. You know, these were not accidents for Carl Jung. These were just ways someone deep inside you knew uh, your life was just not meaningful anymore. Um, there's something in the world soul that uh, despises meaninglessness and disposes of it. And a culture that reaches this point will be disposed very quickly, perhaps hours um, in the larger Western world is an example, sadly and frighteningly enough. But the ancient Greek was not. That, that is, a nihilistic culture does not survive. A nihilistic culture does not produce what ancient Greeks produce. A nihilistic culture does not stand up to enemies, does not stand, stand up to invaders, um, just lets the floodgates open. Uh, but the Greeks did stand up, went through, you know, fire to keep their culture and to a certain degree our culture. So that alone shows you they were, they were no nihilists. But how could they were not be nihilists with what I just said about their view of death? I don't know. That's what I'm trying was to that, was that the main Was that the main puzzle? How without an afterlife do they not slip into the nihilism that we seem to have slipped into? That is, yeah. That is, that, that is the main puzzle. Um, um, and I won't try a, a, an easy explanation here. You know, things come to mind, like, you know, they had known standards, well-known, agreed upon. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's fascinating, however. What was the next stage for you? So you had this professor, his life, his death, his significance, the key to the Homeric world, as opposed to both the modern and the ancient mystical world. What came next for you? So next came a man uh, called Cornelius Castoriadis. Cornelius Castoriadis was a Greek philosopher. Um, he was born, I think, 1920, 20, 25 or 20s, in the early 20s. And he's a philosopher that unfortunately is not that well known around the world. Although for us, most people know him by name. Most Greeks know him by name. We value him, although most, of course, have not read his books. For one reason or the other, he was not, uh, he's not very well known. But when I read his works, he, he blew my mind. And part of it was justified, part of it was not. The part of it that was 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 not justified is that I just had not read enough to recognize what Castoriadis had borrowed from others. So for me, I had not read Marx and I had not read Heidegger. And believe it or not, Castoriadis merged or tried to merge the two. The, the, the revolutionary Marxism that he always was and always remained and Heidegger who he mentions a lot, he recognizes at least part of his debt. Uh, it would be too much to ask him to recognize all his debt. But the more I read Heidegger, the more I understand where Castoriadis took a lot of his ideas. But initially, it's like, you know, coming from a different planet and just being given uh, someone that you think it's Karl Marx and Heidegger in one person, having discovered that he, you're going to be amazed. So for me, that was the thing. That was the, let's say, unjustified admiration. The justified admiration was that he did have ideas of his own. And one of these ideas was the idea of what he called the radical imaginary. Okay, And the radical imaginary was the notion that um, when you try to understand a culture, uh, you drill down and you drill down and you find the institutions, you do what ethnologists do, you know, they, you classify, uh, you describe, uh, you talk with the people, you read their literature, you try to find why, why they do what they do, and you find that things work 
um, one thing refers to another, you know, perhaps one tradition is kind of a copy of an older, more substantial. So you go to that and then you find that that tradition was the product of, um, you know, a moment of crisis in history. So you go to that moment and you go on and you go on and you drill back in time and down into the layers of meaning that each culture is built on. Castoriadis believe that eventually you drill down to a point where you find kind of primal meanings, irreducible meanings, because to re you don't have anything to reduce them with. You know, uh, these ideas are, are, are just there. They're images more than anything, you know. Uh, for example, I was thinking about that actually in context of, of the Jewish uh, imaginary, because all people have a different, you know, cultures have, according to Castoria, the, uh, a radical imaginary, no, not just ethnic cultures, not just the Greeks, the Jews, the French, the, but, you know, the, the, the communist, the, the Muslim, the, uh, you know, modern has a radical imaginary, modernity has a radical imaginary, um, ancient Greece of course, had a radical imaginary, which I'm going to explain, but I mentioned, I was thinking about the Jewish, and there's this image of the father sacrificing his son. So it's Moses, and, and uh, sorry, Abraham and Isaac. Mm -hmm. Then you have Jesus, the father sending his son to be sacrificed, the same. And, you know, the word for this sacrifice is, in Jewish, is Holocaust, you know. And you have another Holocaust in history. Perhaps there is a radical imaginary that produces all three, as strange as it might sound. Um, there's like a source of ultimate meanings for that culture, that, like a flower produces all other meanings, uh, but you can't drill further down, you know. And this notion of the radical imaginary automatically um, made him an enemy of everything that was current during his time. And his time was the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and perhaps the 80s. And what was current uh, was the traditional communism that he grew up with that would deny what I just said, because communism believed that it had found an ultimate theory to explain reality, and that was a very mechanistic, materialistic theory. Um, and Castoriadis showed that the radical imaginary of communism is the same to the radical imaginary of capitalism. He didn't go as far as to identify it into the modern liberal imaginary. Um, for, but he he left it unqualified. But he showed that essentially capitalism and communism are, are spring from the same branch because their radical imaginary is the same. It's the quantification of society and human potential. You know, the 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 defining goals by measuring reality. Uh, numbering, measuring, digitizing, uh, which is the modern imaginary, uh, 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 you know, measuring, the, like he would ask a question, like he would say, how would the capitalist society know that it succeeded? Well, say it would measure how it increases its output in products, you know, and, and, and or, or, or decreases um, inequalities. Okay, how does a communist society define? But the same measures more or less, you know. So in both uh, cases, you have the reign of quantity. You and have that's the, the defining. Of, exactly. You have the reign of quantity, the reign of, and the reason why you can't, according to Castoriadis, reduce this further is because what are you going to reduce it with? What are your tools? Your, the tools of your thinking are produced by the same culture that does the thinking. So when a capitalist society, you know, like you ask a capitalist society, the United States perhaps until recently you you know how do how do you know you're successful it will point to what i just said um the output you know uh the internet uh elon musk uh spacex okay but who defined these these um these standards 
that society itself, ancient Greece would have very different standards, ancient Egypt would have very different. So it becomes circular once you go down to the root level of a culture. You can't really justify it. It's very much like the beginning of the universe. Cultures, according to Castoriadis, just to give you a final image, cultures almost begin like the universe began. And the universe began by beginning. You know, what happened before the Big Bang? No one can say, because space and time itself, we are told, was created during that first moment. So if science works within the, the, the categories of space and time, it cannot think what came before space and time even existed. So there will, can be no scientific explanation of what happened before the Big Bang. Is it fair to say, is it fair to say as an approximation that the primal meanings that constitute or configure the various cultures are structurally equivalent or at least structurally analogous to the cave in the Republic in the sense that there is for Castoriadis no escape from the cave, no transcendence, no natural light that can take you outside of the conventions or the imaginary of your culture? Or does he have some element of escape of transcendence of cross crossing the threshold of the constituted order and seeing it from the other side it sounds from what it sounds like from what you're saying that he did not have that and at the same time i also get the impression from some of the other topics that you work on that the idea of the possibility of crossing the threshold outside of the constituted order and looking back in whether it's a deepening of an understanding is something that you're interested in so how did castoriadis see see this could you get out of the cave of the imaginary is that a false analogy to make in the first place and is that a limitation of his thought if there is no possibility of crossing a threshold or of transcendence well one way i guess to answer is that each imaginary is a different cave so you can swap caves so to speak and being himself being a revolutionary until the end of his life um, he half jokingly said that he's thinking of starting a revolutionary group at the age of seven. So he was still there in his mind. And he believed that a revolution will unleash another big bang, another imaginary will be born, which is unknowable, not just unknown, unknowable, because we think in the categories of our current case. So what can come from another explosion um, the likes of which was seen when ancient Greece was first born, you know, like when Islam was first born, you know, what happened exactly there and an entire culture crystallized. Um, the same people were living before Muhammad and after, but there's a huge difference. The meaning of their lives was restructured uh, within a few decades. And there's evidence that cultures are born very, very quickly. Uh, one of the problems that, um, uh, you know, scientifically minded anthropologists, one of the problems that they have with explaining certain phenomena, like the birth of cultures, is that they do not have an evolutionary structure. You know, scientists, when they've try to investigate history, whether uh, the history of an organism through evolution or the history of a people or, or a rock, it doesn't matter. They look for the steps that led to its current form. But in cultures, you won't find that. You'll find the elements that were, uh, that formed the culture, but these elements had a different meaning altogether. Okay, so you can say, I, I mentioned Islam, you can say that a lot of it was taken from the Bible. Um, some of it was taken from Christianity. Small part of it was taken from Arab paganism, which the Muslims try very hard to deny it even existed. Um, sure, yes, the elements were there. You can trace them. I mean, the, it would be ridiculous to say that the Quran does not have similarities to the, to the Bible and the Bible to the Torah. But they had different meanings back when they were in the Bible and in the Torah. It's like, you know, demolishing a house and building a factory with the same materials. You cannot say that the house became the inspiration for the factory. No, it became the material. Perhaps another factory became the inspiration for the new factory. But the form of the form that something takes 
is what defines it rather than the raw material. Cultures are specific forms of ordering meanings. Whether the, the material pre-existed them it does, is, is a different question, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's the new form. So to, to answer your question, I think as the others would say that, you know, the current cave, although he didn't use this an analogy very much, um, surprisingly, he was not that interested in Plato. Just, just a hint there. Um, but he was hoping f from an escape of the current cage that he identified as that common root between communism and capitalism, which for some reason he left unqualified, although it became part of my work to qualify it and find and, and identify it as the, the beginning of the modern world is where it all began. So, yes, I'm still with him on that, trying to uh, kind of cross that line of modernity, uh, find an inspiration that is beyond the limits of the very, very roots of our modern culture. But being true to his writings, he could not speak any further because speaking about this new beginning would be speaking about it in terms of the old beginning which would no longer make it new uh, if that is an answer. That's such, such an interesting way that this particular problem gets constructed because something in us or in some of us longs to break free from or to understand to its root and therefore to no longer be determined by whatever it is that gives us our being at the moment. If it's the modern world, if it's our imaginary, if it's whatever it is, our cave that gives us our shape, our form, our limit. And what I find really interesting about what you're saying about Castoriadis is that he's not rebelling in the name of something. It's first of all, it's not even a rebellion. It seems like it's an act of understanding that is by virtue of understanding revolutionary, but it's not grasping at something given or something known because you said that it was unknowable. So it's still an object of our desire. It's still an object of our longing. It's still something in us that has escaped the boundaries of the given, but not for an alternative given, rather for some unknown. And yeah. I wonder sometimes the Straussian in me, or let's say the classical political rationalist in me, wonders about whether or not that's sound judgment to want to strive towards something that we don't know what it is yet, because for all we know, it could be worse. The fact that it's novel or the fact that it's new doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's good or that it's better from the point of view of classical political rationalism, I would say, where the impetus to rebel against or just to oppose or to correct, to educate, however we think about it, to modify the given is always with reference to some stable standard, some unchanging and knowable sense of the good. So whenever there is something like what you're describing about Castoriadis, I find it both curious and interesting, appealing. What is it that is longing for the unknown in him, but also slightly worrying or imprudent or, or politically, maybe not naive, but somehow uh, too visionary potentially for politics, to want to overthrow the given order in the sense of something that is inherently unknowable. Is it just we're forced to think about that because it doesn't mean that he's wrong, but it might mean that what politics requires of us, if it is to be a politics of the human spirit, is always going to be subject to what's unknown, uncalculable, unmeasurable, in other words, to what can't be captured. That may just be an inherent dynamism in the life of the human spirit that comes with certain risks, but that must come with those risks, and that is worth those risks or not. But that's where we get a contrast between the Castoriadis, I would imagine, and some other thinkers like Strauss and maybe Plato, as you mentioned, if he didn't have an interest in him, then somehow that also shows in the political dimension of his project. But let me give it back to you if you want to say more about Castoriadis and what came next in your intellectual development. Yeah, I, th I think ju just to add some images to what you just said, you know, perhaps the most tangible um, effect that Castoriadis' teachings had were the the 60s in Paris, uh, May 68, was to some small degree 
not big enough for people to know Castoriadis name because uh, everyone knows May 68. Um, but some small part of it was inspired by Castoriadis. Castoriadis, there was this uh, motto of the Soissons uh, Utah, uh, they, were, they were called the Generation of 68. There was this motto, they had a lot of them, um, um, imagination to power, uh, they called it. Put, put, put imagination, make imagination the sovereign would be another way of saying it. And that was taken from Castoriadis. What I said about the radical imaginer doesn't mean that they understood it. Doesn't mean that they had read this, his books. They must have read articles because he was uh, publishing uh, Castoriadis and a small group of people were publishing a, a, a magazine, philosophical magazine back in the day, beautiful times in Paris, sitting with intellectuals in cafes. Oh, how one wishes <laughs> to be there. And he was publishing right. there uh, a, a magazine called Socialism ou Barbarie, uh, Socialism or, or bar, bar, uh, Barbarism, pointing to the Soviet Union, you know, asking. Um, and in there, a lot of people, you know, he was writing, lots of people were writing. Some of that got out and inspired this generation of 68. Now, a lot of people in your audience, and I guess my audience, are now very critical of the 1960s and the great changes that it 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 uh, promoted in European culture. A lot of the troubles that we're going through today, culturally, uh, you know, the woke culture, third wave feminism, uh, uh, being accused of being all sorts of isms just for having an opinion. Um, they can including be including an opinion about ancient Greece. You know, you yourself are under the gun with the current cultural climate. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm trying to be subtle, although that might change and just go full guns blazing. But, um, you know, I have friends in that community who have been banned, who have been uh, called all, all, all sorts of things. I have been in private conversations for voicing um, opinions that I've heard you or people in your show voice. So... Um, we now trace a lot of the decadence that we see around us back in these youth movements of six, of the 60s. 68 in Paris, I guess, was the European moment. 69, Woodstock, was the American moment and lots of other moments between. And they can be traced. It's not that long ago. Yes, you can trace, you know, um, um, the, the, the crazy notions about gender today uh the subjectivism about gender the idea that there is no such thing as gender and even saying it makes you some kind of sexist um that can be traced of course it can be traced back to these youth movements of the 60s although they themselves did not support these crazy ideas uh, but the seeds were so to that degree you can say that look yes mike you are right this promotion of this radical imagination as a political project can lead to this um, change for the sake of change, change for, for the sake of one generation just doing it differently than their parents, change without measure and without um, uh, virtue. Um, so you could say, although Castoriadis was too weak of an influence in the greater scheme of things to be called by name, say, you did it, you know, uh, there were people who were much more influential, like Sartre, for instance, uh, the postmodernist later, you can identify them. Um, but for sure, you can find some imprudence in this promotion of the radical imaginary that a generation can just go to the roots of their culture and reimagine it in one go. Yet, on the other side, what Castoriade showed is that this act of reimagining the world is what makes us human, ultimately. It's not a, a, a nice to have. Uh, we are here and we are talking because we are based on so many assumptions about reality that we don't even think about. These assumptions were created somehow, not, not necessarily invented. Uh, they came to be the way we understand the world today, the matrix of ideas, the cave, as you said, that we live in, um, came to be at some point. 
and it came to be through the radical imagination. According to Castoriadis, this cannot be reduced to science because science itself is a product of the imagination, of the radical imagination. And modern science is part and parcel of modernity, which just came to be within a couple of centuries in the history of Europe. Um, so you cannot stop it without dehumanizing our species. You know, it's not an option, in other words. You need to go on and reimagining just to be human. I also hear in what you're saying, some ideas in Castoriadis that even though they may have contributed to the current cultural climate could actually be useful in removing some of its most obnoxious characteristics, like the view that the prevailing model of gender and race and equality and equity is the final imaginary and that it must serve everyone at all times for all times, because it definitely seems to have become hegemonic or totalitarian, not at all allowing for even the thought that anybody anywhere else could legitimately, validly, and even more importantly, humanly have a different configuration of what it is to be, what it is to be a man, a woman, a human being, a political culture, what it is to be beautiful, what it is to be just. So I know that for Dugan, for example, the idea of a plurality of Daseins, the existential multiplicity of peoples, is something he can have recourse to to defend the blossoming complexity of human existence. And it sounds like the irreducible plurality of imaginaries in Castoriadis could serve a similar function. Again, independently of the most important question about whether it's true and how to make sense of it as a true account of ourselves, it does seem like it could have that at least rhetorical function or that the idea of a of the idea of many imaginaries is itself a kind of interesting imaginary of the irreducible complexity of human life. Yes, and just to score like a quick victory there, you know, Castoriadis would definitely be against what is happening and he wouldn't even need to pass it through his theories because what is th that culture that you spoke of, you know, that woke culture um, is not a, a spontaneous pro product of the popular imagination. It is clearly pushed from above uh, by certain very powerful centers. Um, so in that, Castoriadis would not even consider it an imaginary. He, he could trace it back to an imaginary, which is, of course, modernity and the modern uh, imaginary and talk a lot about that. But I don't think that it would, would take him a long time being this old school Marxist to recognize, you know, uh, that it's the same people that he was kind of fighting against in his youth that are now setting this agenda. Um, the capitalists that he was fighting in his youth are now pushing something that looks like socialism, but he would not fall for that at all. You know, he, he, he would recognize it for what, what it is. So I, I don't think we, we should even include it there, you know. That's, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. I get the image of, um, of wokeism or of the current cultural uh, climate as being just rephrasing in words that occurred to me and what you were saying, like colonizing of the imaginary, like a parasitic yeah. attack on yeah. the imaginary. And that yeah. the task, yeah. interestingly enough, if we do this sort of reversal, would be to decolonize the imaginary by removing it from this uh, parasitic attack, which has actually snuffed out the, the spontaneous big bang of Mm. of cultural singularity yeah absolutely absolutely and one thing there i think that people uh, like us dare I say sometimes we underestimate uh the power of this colonization um, i i see you know even physically just to link it a little bit with what's happening um, i remember you had a review of a book called the bronze age mindset uh, it's a book written by one Bronze Age pervert. Great name. Uh, and great book, perhaps. I liked I read it, liked it. Um, 
And, you know, in that book, this kind of pseudonymous author um, was promoting the human type of, you know, the pirate, the warrior, the Viking. And he, he wanted to inspire especially young male, younger than me, males, 20-something, uh, to be that, you know, to kind of go Nietzschean style, um, not, even, not even regard morals as a, as a barrier. It, it, it was a dangerous book in that sense, and you can criticize it uh, on the same axis that you just said, that it was imprudent, just pushing young men to become conquistadors again, knowing full well that the conquistadors also uh, performed great crime. But f it, a book cannot contain everything and it cannot contain its full criticism. And so for what it was, I think it was a good book and we need to be human and take it tongue in cheek, as we say, you know, take it with measures. Yet, you know, that book, finishes if i remember correctly talking about these kind of warriors warriors of the past saying you know these times will come again and you know it was a certain degree inspiring what came again the lockdown so in one flick of the switch the whole planet got locked in by some very powerful forces so it's it's not just that young men did not become pirates again is that they could not walk uh, a mile away from their houses. So sometimes us reading these books, talking about these books, talking about ideas, even talking about more serious books like the works of Leo Strauss that you mentioned or Heidegger or Nietzsche or Plato, um, we underestimate how uh, weak, dare I say, to call it for what it is, uh, we are. Um, we're in a small minority and our, our lives can be put on hold uh, by someone somewhere, not to make it sound too conspiratorial, just, again, talking about myth more than true, you know, so, feels like someone can just turn off the switch. So um, now they, after, co after the measures, after what's been happening, I am much more cautious about falling into this bravado of, yes, we're going to, you know, uh, create this new imaginary multipolar society. The old world is out of here. We are the new. Something is, I can sense the push from above. It's very gentle now. It's more pushing you you know, to have some medical procedures. Again, I'm not going to call them by name for reasons of search engine optimization. Um, pushing you to have certain medical uh, procedures, gently reminding you perhaps you should have them. Perhaps we're going to note down if you're a bad boy, you don't have them. Nothing's going to happen for now, but who knows later on. So to, but that, that, that hand that's pushing, I feel it's very, very strong. It's just choosing to push us very slowly for now. So we can read all the Bronze Age pervert we want, but he's not doing the pushing. You know, he is more like a fly at the hands of a giant, perhaps a bronze fly. <laughs> it's a little fly made of bronze. Who knows? But a fly. I don't know what we can do to promote these ideas. Uh... But I'm not as um, hopeful. I wouldn't say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not as certain that these ideas alone can win the day. So r roughly stated, you would have thought that something like the global lockdowns, which were at times as in your face as you could imagine something to be if you were to script it, did not activate the pirate class into some rebellion or some no. uprising yeah. in the name of their freedom. The pirates no. put away their swords and just covered the other eye with another eye patch. And that was pretty much Very that until image. the present day, right? Yeah, exactly. To my surprise, to my big surprise. I mean, I learned something about uh, humans <laughs> in this past year, uh, which I did not expect and did not like, if, if I'm honest. I was caught uh, unprepared for how 
easy it was to lock people in and how easy it was for them to accept something that on closer inspection, they all felt was a little off. You know, they were, they all felt that it's not exactly how we're presented. Uh, there's some gaps in the mainstream narrative, yes. Uh, but let's keep going, you know. Mm. It's not like people became some uh, fervent ideologues like in the Soviet Union, you know. Uh, they were all, all kind of dragging themselves along, half believing what they heard, but still having a very passionate disdain for anyone who would question it. Uh, all their passion was directed to people like me, people who would just question it, you know, not, not all, always politely. I'm not going to lie in, in private, but just questioning it. And I just got a very strong push that I didn't expect. So, uh, yeah, it was a little bit of a disappointment having read exactly, like you said, the Bronze Age mindset and going, well, maybe there's something moving in youth culture that uh, is promising. But then I saw that even if it is, I'm not saying that it's not moving. I'm not saying that these things do not have an impact. I'm saying that the physical forces that constrain us feel very, very strong nowadays, you know. Okay, I think it's a topic we can return to as we continue the conversation, because I know that you, from a very early date, have had some very serious questions and concerns about the policy response to coronavirus and about its significance, as we're discussing here, for what we think about the possibility of political action and the meaning of theoretical alternatives. When the rubber hits the road and you see that things are not playing out the way you could have imagined, not even to a tenth or a hundredth um, degree, then clearly we have to reconsider some fundamental premises. And I know that on your show, um, people who are watching this or listening to it should know that besides Ancient Greece, revisited the video channel, which produces amazing content. Again, I recommend everybody goes over there and subscribes. You also have the On Tyranny podcast where you have had discussions about the coronavirus policy dimension, in particular, the unwillingness of people to consider the question carefully en masse. And even in some very specific areas, like I heard your conversation, I think it was episode six, where you'd said libertarians rolled over pretty quickly and other people who typically would have defended basic liberties and would have found it unthinkable the extent to which they've been trampled on. Uh, well, we find it unthinkable the extent to which they've kept silent about that trampling. So I do recommend that people listen to On Tyranny if they want to get deeper into your long form conversations on the coronavirus response. But just for now, can you say what came next for you after Castoriadis? So we have the basic line taking you through comparative mythology, Joseph Campbell, the professor who gave you some access to the Homeric alternative to both the modern and the mystical mm -hmm. world. And then Castoriadis with the Irreducible Imaginations. Was there a next step or next phase for you? Where did that open up to? And how have you developed since your reading Castoriadis? Well, I guess... What, what came after is it was more physical, biographical, was me leaving uh, Greece, oh, going away uh, and spending the next 13 years living in, in, in the United Kingdom, in London, and then living in the south of Spain, in Andalusia, in Malaga. And that is a um, ph philosophical journey on its own. And... It was there that I came in contact with what we talked about as a kind of decadence because I had some very romantic notions in my mind about living abroad. Um, perhaps they looked more like Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris. Um, and I saw that, you know, kind of Europe was not the Europe that I was taught about. Um, just a generation before me, uh, young men as I was, would travel to, to Paris, mostly. Few would go to London uh, and, 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 and they would engage in some serious like cultural movements of the day, you know, and they would come back full of these ideas and the people they met. And I felt that my case would not be their case at all. There was a spiritual uh, a wasteland 
to a certain degree. I mean, ironically, one of the first books that I read was uh, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, <laughs> which was uh, another offshoot from Joseph Campbell, uh, just connecting the dots there. You know, Joseph Campbell had this image. He believed that uh, after Christianity was imposed, Christianity perhaps was one of the first religions to be imposed uh, by the sword to some degree. Of course, to another degree, people were already prepared uh, because just like I said before, when this Homeric view receded and this more mystical Dionysiac Orphic then became Christian, people were already prepared for uh for Paul's preaching of salvation, let's say. So to a certain degree, people adopted Christianity. This must be remembered that the culture was leading to and pointing towards that in one way. But to another degree, it was definitely imposed by the sword. And we have to hold these two contradictory ideas in our heads. And a lot of the temples that I talked about were ruins today. They were ruined first by the Christians, like the Parthenon was first defaced by the Christians. And that is part of history, whether we like it or, or not. Um, so what, what, what Campbell said is that um, when Christianity was imposed, um, there was a kind of spiritual deadening because perhaps, and it's the first time that I'm thinking about this actually right now, I talked about this top-down pressure, this, 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 this modern uh, uh, woke culture, as I called it, being not something that arose spontaneously, but something that was imposed from the top down. Christianity was to a certain degree, you know, although far richer um, and perhaps far more true to woke culture, was also to a certain degree imposed by the top. And according to Campbell, that turned uh, Europe into into a wasteland spiritually you know in the middle ages and the image is the image that you get of the quest for the holy grail the holy grail according to campbell is that object that symbolizes this re rejuvenation this contact with primal being with with the radical imaginary of castorialis but to get there the knights of the round table had or so the poets tell us had to cross a wasteland uh and T.S. Eliot plays upon this concept of the wasteland and he writes the poem, you know, the wasteland, uh, very symbolic, very strange, uh, not particularly to my liking perhaps, but he has this image of modern Europe uh, being a wasteland. And that's kind of what I found uh, when I moved to London. I found a lot of opportunities. Uh, new ca career paths open to me, which were very important back then, uh, making money, uh, making something of myself, getting into all sorts of adventures, uh, spiritual, emotional, sexual, you know, just 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 being out there. Um, but this on the spiritual side, you know, I felt this 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 gap, this 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 missing part. Um, and it was just around that time that I discovered Nietzsche, um, which was very fitting, <laughs> you know, to, to discover. And it was yet another thing that hit me quite powerfully. So I read his uh, Birth of Tragedy, again, pertaining to the ancient Greeks. I saw, you know, for the first time, this idea that he had the Dionysiac and the Apollonian. Um, if we were to relate it to what I just said, you know, the Homeric worldview would be the Apollonian component of ancient Greece, and the Dionysiac would be the pre-Indo-European, pre-Homeric, uh, Mother Earth. Uh, I understand that uh, Alexander Dugin, whom you interviewed, has an even finer distinction between the purely the Dionysiac and the, the Sibelian, as he calls it. Um, for Joseph Campbell, let's go until that point. For Joseph Campbell, these would be one, uh, you know, the pre-Indo-European uh, Mother Earth kind of religion that promises life as a renewal, as the seasons get renewed, life gets renewed, you are going to get renewed. Dionysus is the god that symbolizes that, the ever-dying, ever-rising god. And uh, on the other side, you have the Homeric 
linear, uh, one life, one chance, one uh, reality. Um, and these two, uh, Campbell identified how historically these two cultures came into contact. Much of Campbell's work have to do with this combination of the Indo-European to the pre-Indo-European. And uh, if someone watches my episodes on the Argonauts, uh, I, I talk about this and I show how the legend of Jason and the Argonauts are a combination of uh, sh betray the the legend. Greek many Greek legends work in the seam of these two cultures coming together. You know, you have the legend of Zeus and Semele. And Zeus is an Indo-European god and Semele is a pre-Indo-European mother, earth goddess. Uh, uh, you have Jason and Medea. Medea is a witch. She's a god. She's a priestess of the goddess Hecate, clearly dark mother, dark goddess, pre-Indo-European. Jason, solar Apollonian hero, steals the golden fleece, gold, the sun. You know, many Greek legends work in the seam of these two cultures. And Nietzsche mentions these, but in a very different context that shed some light to this kind of de decadence that I saw, but was very hard for me to identify because everything was going fine with my life. My life was progressing. Uh, I, I, I was making progress, material progress for the first time in my life. So I could not really complain. But also there was a sense that there's something, and I'm, I'm just going to share a little moment where that I, I am usually refraining from mentioning it, even among friends. But I think that this audience that's going to be listening is more equipped to deal with what I'm about to say than some even personal friends. Okay. And it was a very simple moment, uh, but I still remember it. So it must be important. And it was, I think, 2010 when they, you know, 2012 were the London Olympics. So very big event. England, you know, still prepares in time in contrast with Greeks that do everything in the last moment. But perhaps even ancient and modern Greeks, for that matter. But in London, they were preparing, so they were putting up ad ad advertisements even a couple of years ago. So we're 2010 around, and there was uh, there was a big uh, billboard uh, right above my uh, bus station, uh, beautifully illustrated scene, like, almost like a, a cartoon illustration, but very, very beautiful. And the scene is whoever's been to London knows Piccadilly Circus. Uh, it's a very central square. So this beautiful illustration showed Piccadilly Circus from, from a top angle, uh, where you have, I think, five different roads meeting and uh, cars coming all, all different ways. And in that image, all the traffic had stopped. All the cars had stopped, like tens, hundreds of cars on all sides. They had all stopped. And some of the drivers had gone out to witness what was happening just in the middle and just in the middle what was happening was you had uh athletes in wheelchairs playing basketball impromptu you would imagine just you know kind of uh, a couple of them started throwing the ball around then more came and then the whole it, it felt like this whole civilization had the the image that it was promoting for the olympics the ancient greek games of human excellence was this idea of the the handicapped you know being promoted as the ideal not the able bodied not the body in its perfection not apollo anymore you know but the weaker was promoted up and i felt that what, there was something wrong with this promotion i could not express it and I'm still um, usually refraining, although I'm saying this in, in public, because it was something that I felt very quickly. And had it not been for Nietzsche, I, I would have drowned in my own uh, thoughts. Uh, but Nietzsche somehow, that I'm not going to get into this because it's a very big topic. A lot of your audience are familiar with his work. But Nietzsche at least gave me a vocabulary to speak out this feeling that there was something wrong with what I was seeing, which is still something that you cannot 
to speak about, sometimes not allowed to speak about. Uh, we are both of us risking uh, our probably play. even less even less now than then. So the ten years haven't been yeah 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 no, helpful to allowing less. us to speak about these things openly. So so so, so that was a big uh, also moment for me. This living in this world and having Nietzsche just giving me some tools to think about. And how about the move then from England to Spain? Because I imagine that that's a different philosophical geography, a different geography of the soul, different everything. So what was that like for you and what new philosophical insights and psychological aspects came with the move to Spain? So, you know, um, I do live half my life in mythical time. So in the pattern of the hero's journey, being in London would be taking the castle. Uh, the castle that I took was the banking towers of the city. I uh, didn't take them, didn't conquer them. I worked there, very proud, climbed my way to these kind of uh, top companies as a software engineer, which is what I do uh, as a day job to this day. And uh, very, very slow climb. And I felt, and as it happens, you know, you, you you lose that treasure. So I did not make, I did not create wealth for myself. I created a great income, and I was very proud of the life that I could offer myself and uh, my girlfriend at the at the at the at the time uh, in the center of London, having everything we needed. Uh, but I did not make wealth, uh, like Ulysses, like Ulysses. I lost it on my way back. Okay, so Spain would re re represent this downgoing that happens when you're just entering, you know, late thirties, I guess, entering middle age. Uh, this it, entering middle age is the real way, because because today people think you have to be fifty to enter middle age, but your body has a different opinion. Okay, Carl Jung correctly placed it at mid to late thirties. You know, it's not doesn't. The fact that we could be living up until 200 is not going to make a difference in that. You know, the soul has its own uh, uh, life cycle. So for me, that was it, kind of uh, uh, being there in, in this very beautiful place that I still have great memories of, uh, very uh, calm, calm and, and, and serene. The, the, the weather is very even. The people are very mild, very mild, very mild tempered. And I remember... Um, discovering a new fruit that they called khaki then uh, looked like an orange apple and uh, I loved it and I was e eating it every day I, I don't eat that many fruits um, don't like they perhaps don't fit very well with my stomach but that one fruit fitted and I ate a lot of it and uh, it was just when I was thinking that everything you know it's it's fine perhaps I didn't buy the house uh, but I didn't try either you know, so I was there and I was thinking of, I wouldn't mind like staying, spending the rest of my life here eating that fruit. And then I learned that uh, that fruit was called uh, uh, the lotus, was the fruit that uh, 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 Ulysses' uh, mates ate and forgot their home. <laughs> okay. And ge geographically, it was pretty much there. I mean, it was most probably, we don't know the homeric geography exactly how it maps to our geography uh, half of it is mythical geography psychic rather than geographic but if we need to put the the land of the lotus eaters would probably be uh, on the other side in in, um, in morocco okay but close enough dare i say uh, and, and i remember this moment i said it kind of half jokingly half seriously it kind of pointed me to where I was in the circle, you know, in the circle, which was this place of kind of down going and, and then coming back, having to come back and, and come back home, even if that home is the cave. And to some degree, modern Greece does look, feel like a cave. Um, and it does feel very empty at times and very poor spiritually it's not that it's a far cry from the ancient past it's a far cry uh, uh, from even its geographical neighbors you know for various reasons uh but i felt i had to be here uh not because it was more fun but it was where this uh circle was leading necessarily you know the the psyche has its own rules i think
So your hero's journey brought you back to Greece? Yes. And then what did you decide to do? When did you begin putting together the pieces of the puzzle of the meaning of this whole process? Was it clear to you what you were going to do there or what came to you next? So at the end of my, my journey in Spain, when, just when I was deciding to, to, to come back, I, this idea came to my mind. And it was also kind of an anchor to throw, to pull me towards Greece because this show that I'm doing, it has to be done here. You know, it has to be done in this, in this, in this place. Um, so it was perhaps an excuse that I made in my mind initially to to to, to come back, to pull me back. Um, but it was conceived there, and it was to be done here for sure. You know, how has ancient Greece revisited the channel? the on tyranny how has it been for you doing it what's the reception been like have you faced pushback threats of cancellation are you finding that these themes are resonating with your audiences is it primarily in greece that you are getting your audience or what's your impression now that you've been running the channel for a while and also maybe you can say a little bit more i know that you have had people on your show not just on the podcast to talk about contemporary affairs but also historians, poets, artists, philosophers, musicians, you do work on the significance of Greek music. So I was wondering if you could say, and of instruments, if you could say a little bit about how that has been for you, the process of running the channel and getting the audience who may be interested in the ancient Greek revisited topics, and also any, any strange insights you've had about what's resonating, what's not. I know some of the themes you have picked can seem controversial, even, correct me if I'm wrong, just talking about Indo-European Indo culture pre, post, I think you had said at some point that that is a complicated topic for some people to even think about that you have to address it very delicately. Uh, so what, the, what is that, now that you're in the channel, you've had this hero's journey, you went all the way back to where you came from and you launched the channel, what, what has that been like for you? So, you know, initially I wanted to, uh, to, to, to see um, what was troubling our culture through the tools given to us by ancient Greece and try to reimagine an alternative. Um, I did think that I would have backlashes of different kinds. Uh, one type would be that, who are you? you you're not a historian. You're not an archaeologist. You don't know what you're talking about. I had none of that, surprisingly. Um, I mean, I didn't promote myself as one, but that, that's that's not a problem for a lot of uh, YouTube uh, trolls. Um, for some reason, I felt that YouTube in particular uh, has is, is like a magnet for these kind of haters, uh, m perhaps even more than other social networks. But I didn't have any of them. The other kind would be, yeah, the topics would be considered not politically correct. Um, I didn't have that either. Now, the reason I can justify this more, because I did not push these topics hard enough. I've been very subtle and very, yeah, very subtle, I guess even sophisticated about how I'm approaching these topics as of yet. You know, I don't have this one big moment where unfortunately we live in a crude era and even people who i admire for taking a stance against this political correctness they almost borrow uh the language of the enemy you know uh they're they're loud they're uh in your face they'll do these rough edits this rough cuts with uh, strange noises and uh, cartoonish kind of effects and the aesthetic is very much you know uh, like like that of the people whom they criticize so I tried to do something different I tried to do something more subtle and with a very different aesthetic so perhaps the fact that I haven't had a lot of backlash is also proof that I have failed to push for these ideas. Um, I don't know if I would change something. Perhaps I'm going to change something from now on. 
but I deny to just go to this, uh, you know, kind of very cheap swear words, uh, rough cuts, sounds. Uh, your, your channel does not take the low road into any of these debates. No, 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 no. So, so, so I haven't had the backlash, but partially that's a bad thing is, is what I'm saying, you know. So do you find, I mean, what I love about your channel, what I love about the work that you're doing, you have serious and dramatically effective and very thoughtful presentations of love, of beauty, of war, of the gods. And somehow these are the topics that are the pillars of the possibility of a return to ancient Greece. If we're going to revisit ancient Greece and see what does it have to give us today, it must have to be something like reminding us of beauty, of what it is for there to be beauty in a world that has become so inundated with ugliness that it's become indifferent to its absolute dominance. Or what is it to understand war in a true sense? What is the martial spirit and not just some fake um, fraudulent presentation of conflict or of aggression and so on with the other topics that you treat and as the universities so you know and the people who are watching me who know me know that I left academia in part because of my work on Dugan but as I have been on the outside looking in the problem is getting worse with the universities especially in those fields and in those departments where you would want there to be a battle for the angel, as Dugan puts it, or as we could say, a, a reminder of what's great and noble and dignified, not just about the human spirit, but about the spirit of the world, about the cosmos, about the whole in which we find ourselves, that somehow we can bring close to ourselves, that we can embody, that we can honor, and that we can love. And so as the universities are becoming places of impoverished presentation of classical, not just classical wisdom, but of, remember, people aren't only in search of answers here. They don't even have the formulation of the question. They don't have the topics. They don't have access to the key categories and terms that could give them a meaningful life. So the university's star is falling and the online world, its star is rising, I think. Now, maybe that's oversimplification, but it really struck me that just as Princeton Classics Department is declaring its war on the study of ancient Greece, I'm watching your channel where there's ancient Greek text across the page in very well produced productions that inspire me and make me want to learn more. So do you see what, what gap or what niche do you see yourself filling now? And what are your plans for ancient Greece revisited? And again, do you what do you see that you're tapping into and what do you want to inject into because it's not just from what I know about you and from what I know about your channel you don't just want to punch <laughs> down and you don't just want to say there's a lot of insanity yes of course there's a lot of insanity and we do need actually to highlight it and to a certain extent to attack it to mock it uh, to understand it that's a very key thing as well how did it get to the point that even to consider the importance of beauty is already to become suspect I mean that is a big puzzle and it should it shouldn't ever become obvious to us that that's normal or natural or that it was built into the necessary development of things. So what themes do you want to continue to present? Do you see yourself as really injecting those topics into public discourse that are increasingly being uh, silenced or censored? And what is your project going forward for not just Ancient Greece Revisited, but you write essays you've published in the Warden Post and you have a, a wealth of, I think, deeply won, like earned insights and impressions that are more thoroughly thought through than you have in the low level culture war. So what do you want to do with all of that moving forward? What's your vision for um, your own next steps? Yeah, um, I definitely want to, to, to make a mark. Uh, you know, I definitely want to make my channel the the go-to place for a new vision of ancient Greece. Um, but it, I also am true to the to the political uh, role of changing our discussion into becoming political again, which is something that we've have uh, forgotten. 
um, this rule of experts is exactly what Plato was warning against. And I've made an episode on that, probably going to make more. But what we see now is kind of Plato's nightmare. Um, the one mistake that a lot of people have make is to believe that ancient Greece, for all its glories, was in no way uh, equipped to deal with what we're going through, that we're, what we're going through is so novel that, the, that Plato could not have imagined. You know, I mean, we have spaceships that are going to take us to Mars. Like, what does someone who lived two and a half thousand years thought the Earth was flat? Plato didn't think the Earth was flat, but that's what a lot of people think that Plato thought. You know, that what does he have to, to tell us? And what do you know from uh, being a Straussian, like you called yourself, and reading Strauss, is that the ancient Greek political philosophers uh, were adequate for explaining what we are going through today. What we are going through today, and especially as of last year, is well within their means of understanding and theorizing and philosophizing. So if I can bring this back, you know, that, 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 that would be a victory. Now, on the flip side, you know, you mentioned how things are happening in, in YouTube. And yes, depending on which day you find me, I'm going to tell you a yes or a no in that sometimes it feels like we're winning and sometimes not. Um, sometimes I see channels that do some great work being switched off at the flick of a switch, demonetized, gone forever. You know, yeah, they find other platforms. But they're very small and who knows for how long. Again, it's this push of the giant hands, you know. So what is our place if we are going to be political, which means try to affect change in our world rather than just talk? And I always remember, perhaps this is a good closing mark, uh, there's a book by Ernst Jünger uh, called The Forest Passage, which is very, very interesting. Jünger was a very, very interesting man. It was kind of the German uh, Hemingway, uh, only that he fought for the other side uh, that Hemingway was fighting. And uh, but he wrote a book called Storm of Steel, which is very famous, uh, being himself a storm trooper in the First World War, fighting with an, as an elite soldier uh, for the Germans. And then he was, for political reasons, he was a, 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 a captain in the Third Reich's army. But he wrote some great books and one of one of them is called the forest passage which was written in the 50s and that is very interesting because you think that and like like being a captain in 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 the army d does not necessarily make him a nazi in spirit we have to remember that and um, he was an artist and an intellectual and uh, i'm very certain and there's evidence to 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 know that the fall of the third reich found him in, in agreement and in joy. Uh, yet, some years later, um, he wrote this book, The Forest Passage, as if a, a, a new and even worse totalitarianism, totalitarianism was just around the corner. He doesn't qualify it. He, he doesn't say whether he's afraid of the Soviet Union, which was going very strong, or a rise of another Reich or what he doesn't qualify it which makes it even more interesting but there's a spirit and in that book he presents the 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 life of a dissident in that to new totalitarian uh, regime that he's describing in brief he doesn't go to the lengths of George Orwell or uh, Aldous Huxley you know it's 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 very sketchy very not very easy to read perhaps not even very pleasurable to read it it's not a, a literary book that I love, but that life of the di dissident takes you through the steps uh, that a dissident uh, will have to go through in this society. So very in brief, okay, these steps are the first, in the first few pages, our, our character, our dissident, uh, decides to vote for the opposition. That's his rebellion. So the day of the elections come, uh, again, he doesn't qualify it. What are the parties? What are the sides? Is it left, right? Is it a new, uh, are there new categories? We don't know. 
he, but he votes for the opposition. So he says he musters all his courage because he knows that although uh, votes are in theory uh, secret, he knows that this regime is so totalitarian, it's controlling everything. So, But he's going to do it, he's going to risk it. So he goes to the voting booth and he casts his vote for the opposition. He goes back home, opens up the TV, and he sees what? He sees the news reporter saying, you know, the, the, the extremists, because that's how the op opposition to the mainstream are always called, the extremists are growing, you know, from 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 2.8 now they're at 3.1 so first you realize they're a very very small minority and then what he realizes in this novel is that he actually infor reinforced the powers that be uh, because now they have um, an excuse to crack down even more you know because the opposition is rising from a tiny perspective to a tiny plus more it won't make a difference so he realized that him casting the vote only makes the system stronger. Then he goes on to another endeavor and he becomes an artist and he becomes kind of a graffiti artist, which I guess was very far seeing for the 1950s. And again, it's not described in full, but it reminded me as I was reading of Banksy, whoever knows is a, a, a British uh, graphic artist. Uh, he spray painted a lot of walls, very distinct style kind of saying it without saying it. Uh, political in some sense, but very, very subtle, uh, very beautiful. So I, I had this in mind, Banksy's uh, kind of uh, more political uh, pictures. And so he does that, that doesn't work. So he goes on, goes on, goes on. One thing, that nothing works. Nothing works for this dissident. And then he kind of takes the forest passage, which is physical, metaphorical, um, more metaphorical, I would say today, because it does there doesn't seem to be any hiding place anymore uh, f f in the physical space. But he takes his forest passage, and he becomes like a rebel, and 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 this for this passage taker for Ernst Jünger, the writer, is like a new type of person, new human type that's going to emerge. And at the end of this novel, he close he after all these things. Junger, the writer, concludes that if something is going to happen, it's going to happen in language. Okay, there's 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 a magic in language, a power in language that's irreducible. It's always going to be a step ahead. Whoever powers does not matter. George Soros, in conjunction with space aliens, it does not matter. Language has a, a, a magic that's always going to be elusive. It's, it's, it's going to be elusive to any power structure, is what Junger says, and I believe. And as you're speaking, I just pulled up this passage because I recently sent it to, 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 to John Waters, whom I interviewed. So I have this passage in front of me. I just, with your permission, going to read in brief. And that's how Ernst Junger's book, The Forest Passage, ends. Junger says... Two kinds of history can be said to exist. One in the world of things, the other in the world of language. The second contains not only the higher insight, but also the more effective power. Even the base must constantly regenerate itself from this force, also when it turns into violence. Yet the suffering passes and transfigures into poetry. It is an old error to believe that we can predict when a poet may be awaited by the state of language. Language can be in full decay, and yet a poet will emerge from it like a lion out of the desert. Conversely, fruits do not always follow an exceptional bloom. Language does not live from its rules, for otherwise grammaticians would rule the world, which perhaps a nice pun for postmodernists. On the primal ground, the word is no longer form, no longer a key. It becomes identical with being. It becomes creative energy. That is the source of its immense, unmintable power. And there, no more than, appro no, no more than approaches take place. Language lives and moves around silence as an oasis forms around a spring. A poem confirms that a man has managed to, to enter the timeless garden 
time then lives on this, even when language has declined to a mere instrument for technicians and bureaucrats and tries to borrow from slang to simulate vitality. In its latent power, it remains utterly unweakened. The dullness and the dust merely touch its surface. If we dig deeper, we reach a well-bearing seam in every desert of this earth. And with these waters, new fertility rises to the surface. So I think that says pre pretty much what I'm trying to connect to. Very nice. You've been hearing from Michael Michaelidis of Ancient Greece Revisited. There's a link to his channel in the description below. I strongly encourage you to go subscribe and watch his videos. And it's going to be a question for us whether ancient Greece is just our past or whether it's also our future. But at any rate, it's something that we must think about and we must think through. Thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. I'm Michael Millerman. See you in the next program.